everyone. <laughs> it's Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Tuesday at 2. Oh, wow. I should take these glasses off because we got some ring light action. So, how is everyone doing? It has been a very strange time in America, the United States of America, where I live. We've had a horrific thing that we're seeing in the news. There has been a surge of new COVID cases, and that's really upsetting. Um, and New York is still kind of coming down. We were the biggest, and now we're seeing our compatriots in the South and in the West. They're having significant rises of COVID, and it's really sad, and I hope we can get our acts together and resist going out to bars and clubs, and um, we have to social distance, which is really hard and challenging, and we have to wear masks because actually that helps. So on that note, I think for those of us who make money from playing live music, playing in restaurants, playing in bars, playing out in public, this is not great news. This is bad news. And my guest today is someone who has extensive experience with how to make money using your musician's website. So I'm really, really happy that Ross is here and will be joining us in a moment. I'm gonna let Ross Barber Smith do his own introduction because he is better at introducing himself than me, but he is someone I've known for many, many years and his company, Electric Kiwi, has built websites for me, for my books, for several of my clients. He is a guru master at all things WordPress related. If you'd like to see some of his thinking around um, how to understand how to make money using WordPress, you can look at cyberprmusic.com. On the blog, he has recently rewritten an article that he wrote many years ago with us uh, and updated it for 2020. So without further ado, I am going to bring Electric Kiwi, Mr. Ross, onto this live with me. Hello, we're waiting to connect. There he is. Hey. Hi. How are you? I'm loving the platinum white. Gorgeous. Well, as long as you don't pay any attention to the roots, because it has been probably 14 weeks or so since they, they've been done. <laughs> um, but other than that, thank you. Fantastic. So I just gave um, my intro, but I would love if you could kick us off by giving us a little background about you and what you do. Would love that. Sure. Okay. Um, I thought your intro was great for the record. So uh, you've done half the job for me. Um, yeah, I specialize in websites for musicians. That's what I do on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. Um, my story is I thought I wanted to be a musician, so I went to university and studied popular music. I did vocals. Um, realized in my last year that rejection was not a good thing for me um, and that uh, I probably didn't really have the confidence to kind of go forward and do music as a career. So I do take my hat off to any musician who is uh you know doing this for a living because it's a tough gig it's rewarding but tough um and so yeah so it was in my final year at university one of our projects um and this actually comes to how i met you um was a promotional marketing project which was basically we were told do whatever you want just you run with it and we'll grade you on it so that was very helpful um, so <laughs> I decided that I would build a website to promote myself as a singer songwriter because I'd been doing websites as a hobby since I was about 12 years old. Um, and I ended up getting a really good grade for that class. Part of that class was to get feedback from industry professionals. And this is where Ariel came in. Um, as one of the few people, I emailed probably hundreds of people <laughs> to ask them for some very brief feedback on the project. Ariel responded. And uh, I've been following you ever since. And that was 12, 12 years ago, something like that. It's been a long time. Um, 
So I decided, well, maybe there's something in this. Maybe I could use my web design skills combined with the one thing, the only thing really that I care about enough to make a career of, which is music, and uh, and do that. So long story short, I worked some horrible jobs for a while <laughs> until I decided, you know, I'm going to try and do this by myself. No experience running a business whatsoever um, and just kind of making a go of it. And it's been seven or eight years and then still doing it. So something went right somewhere <laughs> along the way. Yeah, and there's always a huge demand. Whenever I recommend you, I'm like, don't try to rush him because he's going to have a lot of clients in front of you. Um, so kudos to you because Thank you. working in the world that we work in where you're asking independent musicians to pay you is a challenging, it's a challenging, it's a challenging base to work with because most independent musicians don't have a huge amount of disposable income. Yeah. And so you have to be good at what you do or else people will talk and you will not have a job. That is the truth. Yes. So, <laughs> so I talked a little bit um, in the, in the run up to bringing you on today about COVID it's here, it's happening. I have a couple of friends who are in the major players, the, the big agencies of the world and the big ticketing agencies of the world. And they are on calls, which are consistently now tolling the bell that we are not going to have live music probably until 2021 and beyond. So yeah. this is obviously incredibly alarming for artists who have made their living from live music. I think we all know it, what else is kind of horrifying and weird is Spotify's stock prices are surging right now. Why everybody's at home listening to Spotify. Unfortunately, most artists are not going to get a piece of that stock surging pie. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here to talk to us about making money with your website. I do want to say that one thing we've always said here at Cyber PR is your website really exists to do two things. And please tell me if you have, if you don't agree with this or want to add something. Thing number one, obviously, is to give you a home base online. Why do you need a home base online? Because you don't own Facebook, you don't own Instagram, you don't own whatever thing you love. And they could change the rules tomorrow, as we've learned. First, we saw it with MySpace, then we saw it with Facebook. And if you're putting all your eggs in the Instagram basket, thinking, oh, I'll just DM everyone there. Well, you don't know. Instagram could cut you off from that tomorrow. So that's the first thing, is to have your own home base. And the second thing I always say is to make money. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. I'm sure you have a lot to say about establishing your own home base online. So I'd, I'd love for you to chat a little bit about what does that mean and how do you bring that to life for your clients? Yeah. Okay. So I do, I agree with you. Um, I think the home base thing is probably one of the parts I feel most kind of passionate about because while it's great that art is on social media and I do think art should be on social media. It's no replacement for the, the thing that you own, that you've got the control over. Um, because like you said, Facebook could go the same way that MySpace went. And for those of us who remember MySpace, um, a lot of artists built their, they use that as the only platform that they existed on. So when MySpace, when everyone kind of left MySpace, all these artists were left with no way of contacting their fans. Um, and that was pretty tragic for a lot of them. Some of these artists had millions of fans and it was like instantly overnight, they had nothing, um, which is a pretty scary and kind of crazy thing to think about. Um, so yeah, I think having your own website is really important. I think first impressions are a big thing and being able to brand yourself in a visual way um, that you can't really do on platforms like Facebook and Instagram and you can do it to an extent, but not as fully, I think, as you can on your website with your own domain name. I think having all of that just instantly shows that you're serious and you're dedicated to what you do and that, you're, that you've made an investment in, in your music. Um, and that 
for me is a big thing. Like if someone contacts me, you know, because they want to be on a podcast, if they've got their own website, instantly I think they mean business. And that's the first thing. So, I mean, that's before I've even checked out what they do. So I may check them out and be like, mm, this is not for me. But still, you made that first impression, which is you're serious about what you do. Um, and in terms of making money, I agree. I think for me, when it comes to independent artists, it's all about the relationship that they have with their audience. And I think one of the key ways to kind of grow that relationship, I think it starts out for a lot of us on social media but then it can be grown and nurtured through your mailing list. And I think, you know, being able to send people to your official website that, you know, they land on it and instantly they know who you are. They know whether or not you're for them. Um, and then they've got the option to sign up to your mailing list. That's a way that you can have a continuous ongoing relationship with them. And then hopefully they will then go on to spend some money, whether it's in your merch store or whether it's by, you know, streaming you hopefully relentlessly um, or going to see you in a live show. You don't know what that's going to look like for them, but I think being able to build that relationship and build a strong relationship over time is really important. Yeah. Um, before we get into the money-making piece, I'd love to hear from you about what are some trends in websites for 2020? I think often when we audit artists, you know, we kind of wrote a router through their entire social channels and we look at their website and we see a lot of websites where it's like, Ooh, 1999 is calling and mm -hmm. you should definitely yes. not have that. So what are some good, just like 30,000 foot view tips for what your website should look like? I mean, I think for me, you want, the main thing is your website needs to reflect your music. Um, so I think, you know, if you're a country artist, black and red death metal vibes are not going to be the thing to go for. Um, and I do think that a lot of artists understand that. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think, think about that first and foremost is please make sure that the colors you choose and the photography you choose, it, it reflects the kind of music that you make because otherwise that's just going to be confusing. Um, I hear what you're saying about 1999. Um, too many widgets, too many things all over the place, not a good look. I think you want to really keep it streamlined and focused. Um, mm -hmm. So what I normally say to artists is think about what the purpose of the site is. So, and that purpose can change over time, which is absolutely fine and it should do. Um, so I think if you are promoting a release, for example, then this iteration of the site should be focused on what that release is. Um, so first thing you see on the homepage should be the latest release. Where can I listen to it? Where can I, where can I buy it? And, you know, where can I sign up to get more? That would generally be the suggestion that I would make. So the trend that I want to see, not necessarily the trend that happens, would be keeping it as clear and focused as possible, making it as easy for the person visiting to get to know who you are and also to then do the action that you want them to do, whether that's buy, stream, subscribe, whatever it might be, I think you want to make that as easy as possible um, with as few distractions as possible. I can understand why artists, they want to embed all their social feeds because they want to get subscribers on YouTube. They want to get followers on Instagram and Twitter and likes on Facebook. But I think you have to remember that you don't want to overwhelm people with too many choices because too many choices often leads to no action and just leads to someone closing down and, you know, you might never see them again. Totally. So if you're a foundational artist, you're just starting out, or you have never really thought about monetization for your website, how do you coach your clients? What is usually the first course of action you take as far as like, okay, I've never made money on my website. What do you advise them to do? Do you have like a process that you take them through to kind of establish what are we selling? Talk us through what that feels like. Yeah, I mean, it's a little different from artist to artist. Um, so I feel some come in with a very clear idea of, you know, I've got these products, this is exactly why I want to sell. Whereas other artists, you're right, are coming in, maybe they don't have an album or an EP ready yet, but they know that they, they need a website to start making money. So I think 
it's kind of twofold. So making money through selling merch or music is one way of making money from your website. But I think another way of making money is through making good impressions and, um, and kind of starting a strong connection, whether that's with like a promoter or someone that's going to end up being a collaborator. So mm -hmm. I think there's definitely ways that you make money directly, which is through your store. But then there are the indirect ways, which are through booking more gigs. Fortunately, that's not really yet a thing in 2020. Um, but, you know, hopefully in 2021. I mean, it well, it could a be a thing that you could get digital gigs, streaming gigs, you know, joining people to collaborate on, on their YouTube channel, do an Instagram live. So I think, you know, there's definitely a mental shift that we all need to have about yeah. what does a gig mean? But I think I know right now and for the foreseeable future, it, it's all about what you're talking about is the what this is now our time to build every single one of us needs to be thinking about how can we touch more people. I think if you are going to be setting up a call to action, like Ross just said, like, what is it you want them to do? The lowest hanging fruit on the totem pole is clearly join your mailing list or text messaging list. If, if you're, if you're doing that just because you need to own those communications with your fan base. Um, and then as far as merch store, talk us through some of the mistakes that you've seen. And I know I've seen a lot around merchandise, around creating a merch store, around what to stock. How do you advise um, artists who maybe don't, don't have a lot of experience with merch on what kind of merch should they think about or explore at first? Okay. So I think one of the big mistakes that I see artists doing is maybe overestimating how much they might sell so they might get a run of 500 t-shirts printed um but maybe not realizing that the design isn't appealing to people or they just maybe don't have the fan base in place to justify you know a bulk order of that many because they're just going to end up sitting in a basement for a while um and unfortunately that is something that happens um so I think one of the ways that you can kind of work around that particular problem is by using a, a print on demand service, even initially to get a feel for, you know, what kind of products you're selling, whether that's t-shirts, hoodies, or other kind of maybe more unusual items. Um, and also to get a feel for what kind of designs people are responding to. So with print on demand, there's a lot of different companies out there that to offer it but it basically it means that you don't have to buy a bulk run of any product they are printed as soon as the person orders so say for example you want to try out five different designs you want to try out five different t-shirts to see what works and maybe you'll buy the most popular one and you'll take that on tour with you that can be a good way of getting a feel for what what people actually want um so you're not spending any money up front it does mean you make less profit on each item that you sell, but it does remove the risk. So I think it's kind of finding that balance of, do you want to spend a lot of money up front and potentially not sell very much? Or do you want to just see how things go and try out the print on demand? And that's right. where I'm leaning at the moment with a lot of artists, unless they've got an established fan base already, or or there's people have been asking specifically for, for merch from them, I would say print on demand is a good way of testing the water. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to, other kinds of merch i mean i kind of i guess i would class cds as merch now because you know most a lot of laptops now don't even come with a cd player um, I know. you have to buy an external player to it just seems crazy to me but i i would say are sometimes making the mistake of maybe getting too many cds printed i think i'm not in the camp that says don't get cds or don't get vinyl like i think physical media still has a place um but you want to try and find out if there's a demand for it to, you know, to determine how much of it you want to get printed because it's, it's, it is pretty big upfront cost to get things printed yeah. and you want to be sure that you're going to shift it. Um, so I would say, you know, communicating with your audience, whether that's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, however you do it, your mailing list, find out if there's a demand for it and maybe do a pre-order before you actually go ahead and get anything printed. I think there's a lot of ways that you can be smart about it. Um, it does mean waiting, and I know a lot of artists want to just jump right in because they get really excited, which I understand. 
you know, you've got a new album, you really want people to, to have it. Um, but I think you need to be smart and just determine whether there's demand for the physical copy before you jump right in and spend hundreds or thousands of dollars getting it manufactured. Totally. Um, so by the way, this is a many way conversation. If anyone has questions for Ross about your website, about merch, uh, oh, is there a print on demand service just to finish that last thought that you, I know there's many, I know you use one, which is the one yeah. that you use? So the one that I use at the moment is called Printful. Um, Printful. And the reason that I, Printful, yep. Uh, and the reason I went with them is because they integrate really easily with WooCommerce, which is the kind of main WordPress store plugin. The only, and it's a funny story with my merch store. I had no intention of opening a merch store myself until a client of mine asked whether she could integrate Printful with WordPress, which got me on a bit of a, down a bit of a rabbit hole that I did not expect to go down of building a test site and building a test Printful store and checking the whole thing out. Found out it was so much easier than I expected it to be that I got overexcited and decided that I would just launch a merch range and just kind of, this is a all in one day kind of thing. I just decided to do it. Um, but I found it incredibly easy to use. There, is, there are some others that I'm currently exploring and the article that I wrote for you, I will probably be revisiting once I've dug a little deeper. But I'm not going to say anything just now because I don't want to promote anything that I've not tested myself cool. uh, at this point. But Printful is one that we like. So if you're yes. going to ask that question, there's your answer. Oh, someone just asked, where's Loki? Oh, Loki is in the other room, I'm afraid. He's too distracting. He will be on my lap. He'll be drinking my tea. <laughs> we won't get anything done if Loki was here. Okay. No Loki. Loki, by the way, is his dog, if you're wondering. Uh, cool. So um, printing on demand is a great strategy. Do you recommend printing small items like stickers or pins, buttons, anything to give away? Like, have, What have you worked on on behalf of artists that has worked as far as right now we're working with a band um, called our train and they're from florida they have printed this really cool vinyl and what they decided they want to do is they want to give their vinyl away as as a just thank you to anyone that signs up for their mailing list which is a huge gift and an expensive give but still super cool and i think they're going to have a nice reaction they're going to build well um have you done anything like that uh, on a website build and, and what what do you recommend around freebies to build your list i mean i am a, i'm a, i do often encourage artists to do a free a free giveaway of some kind um i think the vinyl idea is awesome if you've got the budget to create that and give it away i think i think it's a good idea to give away because that, that'll probably generate a nice bit of press for them as well i would think as well as enormous goodwill with the fans who receive it um so it's a very smart move um but I think, yeah, like a small kind of giveaway, like pins or stickers, or even a digital giveaway can be can be good as well. Um, and I know that some of my clients have done pins and they've been really popular. Um, it really, I think, depends a lot on who you are as an artist and who your audience is, because some some artists will have fans who really love the idea of pins, and they they might have them on their jackets or on their you know, I don't know blazers or whatever they, yeah, wherever they put them yeah, sure. anywhere um whereas other artists may have maybe they've got a slightly older following who are not really that into pins but they might respond much better to something else so i think that's why it's really key to kind of really get to know your audience and find out what they like because that way you can tailor the gift or the giveaway to to them and you're going to get a much better response if you're targeting it at the right uh demographic and the right people it's going to do you so many more favors than just taking a more general approach. But I understand you might need to do a more general approach initially to kind of get to know who your audience is. Um, but yeah, the more tailored you can be, the better. Cool. So aside from the initial look and feel should look clean, be on brand, think about your color choice, your, your color story, the way it, it photographs are, et cetera, um, and your initial call to action. What's the next thing 
that artists should be considering if they're revamping or building an effective website? I think um, mobile comes into it a lot these days. Um, and I think most, most of the web builders out there, whether it's WordPress or Squarespace or you know, any of the big ones, they do tend to kind of take mobile into consideration. Um, but I think you need to be aware of that when you're building I think limit the th kind of things that auto play. So auto play in videos or audio can slow things down. It can be a bit alarming if you're on your phone and then all of a sudden something comes blasting and you don't know what to do. You're trying to find the volume and you're trying to figure out what's, what's going on. Um, so I'd say try and be considerate when you're putting things together. Um, and a term that a lot of designers will use, a lot of marketing people will use is above the fold, which basically means what's visible before the user scrolls. And I think it's important to think about that as well. What do you want? Like, what's the most important thing? And how can you make sure that people see that without having to scroll or having to click somewhere? Um, and that's where the pull purpose thing comes in again. So if you know what the purpose is, then you can tailor that far more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I think there's, even in Google, you can it will give you in your Google analytics. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that too. It'll show what percentage of your audience is, is accessing your website and your mailing list via phone versus going onto a desktop. And I think if you yeah. notice a trend that maybe 60 or 70% of your people are looking at you on a phone, you should really think about optimizing everything so that the phone is your first way that you see it as well. I think, you know, I sit here with my giant computer screen all day long yeah. because I'm blind um, and I like large, you know, I like it all in a large format, but um, I think it's really important to, um, to really notice like how are people accessing you and if you, can know the data, that's really important. Do you wanna chat with us about when you're redoing someone's website, do you like look at their analytics to kind of give them some feedback about what they should be considering or how do you go about analytics and how they play into a website? Yeah, um, I think a lot of the time ours don't have the analytics set up initially um, it is often a question that comes up is like, how do I set this up? And what's the importance of having Google Analytics and um, Facebook Pixel and all these various things. Um, so I think when it's available, I'll look at it and kind of get an overall picture of, you know, how people are using their site, how quickly people are leaving um, and, you know, it, where the data is available, like where they're coming from. Because um, Google, you can get some quite good information now about kind of age groups and and uh, locations. Um, so that's always quite nice to help figure out um, where we're sort of tailoring things. Um, and I think the kind of, one of the big um, pieces of information that Google give you is your bounce rate, which is how many people are leaving without visiting another page. Now, I do wanna say that if you've only got a one page site, don't be alarmed if your bounce rate is close to 100% because you would expect <laughs> that because there's nowhere else for them to go. Uh, I've had some artists panic. It's like, why, why is that 100%? It's like, it's okay. It's okay. Um, but if you've got like a, you know, a multi-page site and people are leaving them after the first page, it's maybe time to start thinking, well, why is that? Is there something wrong with the design? Is it maybe that I'm promoting to the wrong people and people are getting there and finding out this is not for them? Um, the there's a lot to think about and I think analytics are very useful but I would say at the same time don't only think about the analytics when you're analyzing how things are going um, because numbers as with social media numbers only tell part of the story um, if you find that you're getting a lot of people leaving your website but you're getting a lot of people still subscribing to your mailing list or you're managing to sell merch you're, you're probably doing okay um, so I wouldn't worry too much um, but yeah, it does, everything plays a part. I think everything has to be considered when you're analyzing um, what you're gonna do. How would you, um, how would you train or, or coach your clients that you're working with who are maybe new to trying to understand how to ask for money to, 
to start down that journey? Oh, the asking for money part is always difficult. Um, I would probably point them in the direction of Amanda Palmer's The Art of Asking book and TED Talk, because I think that can be a really good way of at least getting into the mindset of asking. Um, and it doesn't always need to be a direct, you know, holding out your hands, asking for money. Um, I think a lot of it can really be about finding out what your audience wants and giving that to them and making it easy for them to get what they want. Um, because that, that in some ways does half the battle for you. If you're providing something that they've asked for already, then very, very uh, likely that they're going to want to, um, to pay for that. Um, but in terms of, you know, maybe some strategies, I think, um, you know, getting people in initially with a free giveaway, you know, saying, you know, this is, this is a sample of what I do can be a good way of then kind of getting them to actually buy more. So if you've got maybe a free EP, for example, I say maybe a free acoustic EP or something like that. And if they like that, then you can say, well, hey, if you like this, then here's an album or here are the fully produced versions of these songs. Um, or if it's, uh, you know, or you could do a sale, like an introductory kind of sale, you know, get people to subscribe to your newsletter and maybe they get 10, 15, 20% off their first purchase on your store. Something like that, I think, can be a good way of, um, of actually getting people to purchase. But one of the key things that Amanda Palmer talks about is, is the art of asking and actually being kind of quite transparent. And I think when I talk about the relationships that people build with their audience, I think transparency is a big part. And I think if artists are quite clear about why it's important that their audience supports them, um, because I think a lot of people, that are, especially people that are not in the music industry, have these illusions that all artists have lots of money and they're living these really glamorous lifestyles and that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. I think if artists are, are, can start to feel comfortable about talking about, you know, I love what I do, but there are challenges, particularly around money, how it, people will feel more inclined, I think, to support them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still trying to work on ways of helping my artists feel like they can have those conversations. Um, but I do think that the ones who are able to speak more honestly and openly with the audience are the ones that are actually seeing some good results. Um, a client of mine, uh, Justin Trawick, who's very good friends with Eli Lev, um, he is very, he, he's what I kind of call the relationship guru when it comes to the music yeah, industry. Yeah, he's amazing. It's, it's strange, like I, he knows everyone. Um, but he's done really well with them, with Patreon and, um, and Kickstarter, like all these kind of things. He just yeah, but let's, able to... let's, let's talk about why he does really well. Because when you yeah. find an artist like Justin Trawick, I always thought it was Trawick, either way, um, you know, you go, go a little bit under the surface and you ask yourself, okay, how is this person doing this? And I first met Justin, was it through you? I think it was through you, but maybe it, it was... Be, yeah. I introduced him to Eli. Anyway, into my inbox comes an introduction to this artist. Um, and he was interested in maybe working with us. And we sent him a proposal about what we did. And it, he, at the time, decided it wasn't for him. He was going to spend his money elsewhere. Totally cool. I have, I don't know, hundreds of those conversations a year. But there is a huge difference between Justin and the other 300 people that I will maybe have an introductory call with or someone on my team will talk to, he offered me something. Mm -hmm. He has a podcast and he has a show that he curates um, in the DC area where he's from. That's a really well attended, super cool show, which is a showcase that he curates. And he just offered like, Hey, if you ever have, you know, an artist that you think might fit this, this showcase genre, I'd love to meet them. I'd love to, you know, help support any artists that you have. And then that's how Eli Lev met him. But when you have something like that, when you can create a community the way Justin has, that is how he knows everyone. Another artist yeah. who I've known for over 20 years, and I mentioned him many times, John Tagliere, he last year had to make a really painful decision to stop music for now. And he is going to be a massage therapist and he's, he's gone on to a different 
way that he's going to earn his shekels every day. However, he has a weekly radio show, a live show where he showcases an artist on Facebook and he, he's having so much fun just doing his radio show live every week. And, and, and I wanted to book one of my artists onto his show and he's completely booked for the next four months. Why? Because he knows so many great artists and he's, you know, he's, he's seeding with all of this joy and love, which is how he does everything. But there, he really understands, like, I have something to offer that I can give back. And he also really understands, so does Justin, tribe building. What tribe are you running with? Like, who is appropriate for you? And where can you find those people? And one thing that John Tagliari did was he realized, because he makes a very specific type of classic rock music, that he went on something called the Rock Boat, which is an annual cruise where really big AOR format bands from the 90s all get on a cruise. This obviously won't be happening for a long time either. Um, but, you know, if you're a huge fan of, uh, I don't know, Third Eye Blind or whatever, there you are on a cruise. You can see this band. You can hang out with fans. And he realized my fan base is older dudes that and dudettes that love this kind of music. If they love Third Eye Blind, they're going to love me. He goes on these boats. He pays for a cabin. He and his wife goes. He meets everyone. And he built an enormous fan base on the rock boat. So for those of you rolling your eyes like, Ugh, that's not my thing, whatever. That's not the point here, okay? The point here is where are your fans? How can you connect with them? And then how do you be the guy that, like Ross just said, Justin knows everyone. Well, he knows everyone because he's got that, that podcast and that show. And he's offering something to the community, which is saying, I am offering you something. And in turn, that's how the world works, right? This is the art of asking. So if anyone yeah. knows an artist that you'd like to mention in the comments, I'd love to add to my list of people. We did talk about Amanda Palmer. Um, Rochelle, I did type that in for you. And um, could you post names? Yes, I will post the names of Justin Trawick and John Tagliari, of course. Um, I can't believe it. We have literally like five more minutes before oh. IG Live is going to cut us down. What is burning, Ross? What do you want to share? What, do you, what would you like to, to pepper into this conversation? Ooh. I don't know. Um, everything just feels so weird right now, doesn't it? It's like, it's mm -hmm. just, it's um, hard to kind of figure out anything just now. So I think um, one of my things I always like to say to artists is really, you know, the importance of supporting each other. Um, and I think now more than ever, we need our support networks of our fellow creatives and our fellow artists because, um, it's tough and I see sadly a lot of artists are you know not sure if they're going to be able to continue because they're not making money through through music live performing anymore um, and I think sometimes all it takes is a kind word a little bit of encouragement um, maybe sharing some of their music or or buying some of their merch if, if you can afford to um, I think just showing a little bit of support um, to yeah, fellow musicians is going to be a key it's fun too. I mean, it's five bucks. If you think about it, if you were going to see an artist at a bar, a beer would be more than five bucks. A glass of wine is 10 bucks. If you just kick that money into a tip jar or send them something on, on PayPal, you're making an enormous and a huge difference. And I've actually, Eli Love was one of the artists that we had um, on the show. And he said, you know, that is a hundred percent how he's making his money right now. So a little bit goes a really long way um, to help artists at this point. So I think that's, that's really a lovely way to end this. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? No questions have come in. So people are hanging back. Hi, Marcio. Hi, Maya. Hi, Hi David. It's nice to see a bunch of our clients are here hanging out uh, with us. No questions. Okay, if anything pops in, we have like two more minutes. They know where we are. They do. Ross, speaking of, 
how can people connect with you if they would like to know more about your work or follow you on socials? So I'm pretty much Electric Kiwi everywhere. Um, not to be confused with the New Zealand power company, also called Electric Kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to tell the difference. I'm sure you will. Um, so yeah, Electric Kiwi pretty much everywhere. My website is electrickiwi.co.uk, which is co.uk. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, just get in touch. I'm happy to answer, have a chat. Oh, I see a question here. Oh, is there one? Yes. Oh, Maya, um, hi. So people are making money from people paying for virtual shows. Yeah, I think um, there are concert platforms like Stage It and Concert Window where you can sell tickets to online shows. But what I'm finding more people doing um, is going live on Facebook or Instagram and just having donations. So most of them are doing donations through PayPal. Um, uh, for Justin Zell. Trawick, who we've been talking about, I actually yeah, built uh, a um, live streaming page on his site. So it has basically all the resources there in one place. So if you want to watch a live stream, you can go there and watch it. You can donate. You can subscribe to his mailing list. You can see his bands in town with all of his upcoming live streams on there. So that's kind of like a one-page solution that we built together. But I know that he's been having a lot of success with the donation side of things. So I think, and again, that kind of goes back to the art of asking. It's like you're not expecting anything, but you're, you know, you're just mentioning a couple of times in the show if you enjoy what we're doing, you know, this helps us keep the lights on, keep, help keeps us fed, helps pay the rent, pay the mortgage. Um, anything you can give is appreciated. And you just don't know who's watching and who's, you know, been inspired enough to donate $5, $10, sometimes $100. You just don't know. Um, That's so true. But people are making money that way. Um, Maya, also at cyberprmusic.com for all of you. There is an article we've recently written about how to make money from live streaming. And there's actually a free download that you can get at cyberparamusic.com, which is how to market and promote your live streams so that you can get more people coming to them. And, um, you know, how often are they doing live streams? That really depends. An artist that I'm going to have on next week, Rich Aveo, he's been doing them every single week. I mean, every single night, four nights a week, he's done over a hundred live streams since the pandemic hit and it's called the Pandemic Piano Show. It's fabulous. But again, that might not be your style. What works for Rich Aveo is he's a guy that plays in wine bars and he's kind of primed to do that. That's what he does for a living. And so he just kind of took what he always does to make a living and brought it inside. Like people shout out, I wanna hear whatever song by whatever artist and he plays it so that works for him that might not work for everyone um but certainly another thing i love eli lev did was he charges but then he has a separate stream for his patreon patrons and he does live shows just for them so there's lots of different ways of of approaching that Ross, thank you so much for hanging out with me today and being my Q&A guest. I deeply appreciate your contribution. Ross has fabulous articles and advice on his website. Follow him everywhere, Electric Kiwi. Everybody stay safe. Wear a damn mask. Have a great week. I will see you next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Thanks for having me. Bye, Ross. Me. Thanks. Bye.